Do you want to do your REIT? Yeah, I promised people I'd talk about a REIT. So uh, let's... Let's, let's do let's do cents as well after it. Let's just make it a long show. Sure, let's make it a long show, but we won't spend too long on either of these because my thoughts about this REIT are similar to a number of my other thoughts about REIT. So this time I'm looking at something called the Alternative Income REIT. Uh, so far in the last uh, roughly month or so, maybe six weeks, it feels like about a month, uh, I've talked about three UK REITs. They have been uh, the PRS REIT, which is a sort of housing REIT that buys houses off developers and, and sells, uh, not sells and leases them out to people. Supermarket income REIT, which was last week, which is fairly obviously supermarkets and primary health properties, which is another um, UK bunch, but this time focusing on things like GP surgeries and health centres. What they all have in common is they are all kind of pure plays. They're all focused on one type of um, building, so whether that's healthcare or whether that's supermarkets or whether that's housing. The one I'm looking at here with the alternative income REIT is much, much more diversified, and it's also much, much, much smaller. Uh, it has a £53 million market cap. Um, and that means that it's hard to write about if you write for The Motley Fool because we have a, a hard floor of 50 million and below that you're allowed to write information only articles and no one's interested in an information only article on a stock they've never heard of so um, it makes it very unpopular to write about but below that we start getting concerned about the idea that we might be we, there is a genuine concern that we might somehow nudge volumes in a way that make a meaningful difference to the share price absolutely not but um, 50 million is where that floor sits. So at 53 million, this is kind of flirting with the, uh, the guidelines of what's available for us to write about. It does come with a 9% yield, though, which is kind of catching my eye at the moment. In terms of where the portfolio trades, it's well, it's either 25% if you agree with my calculations or about 30% if you agree with someone else's below net asset value. In this case, I said last week was supermarket income REIT. I thought that was significant because they were selling properties. In this case, I don't really care very much. Their last disposal they made was, I think, mostly in the name of just servicing their balance sheet. They did sell it above um, net asset value slightly as a hotel up in Glasgow. Um, but their portfolio is fully occupied and they collect their full rents. And what are their uh, properties? All kinds of different things from care homes to hotels to student accommodation to nurseries to petrol stations to car showrooms. This is what we call a diversified uh, REIT. I checked and one of their properties is in a place that's somewhere near Hull. I can't quite tell exactly what they had to pronounce it. It's a care home in a place that I want to pronounce Bruff. Uh, but it's B R O U G H. Steve, anywhere close? Yeah, yeah, that's that's Bruff. Yeah, yep, yeah, Bruff. It's not. It's. Not, I've heard people in Bruff like to be be referred to as Brow, but it's not as Bruff. Okay, fair enough. So if you uh, if you come from there, or if you just like it, Bruff, then you might be interested in this um, kind of uh, stock and the kind of things that we have. So ninety percent, ninety seven percent, sorry, of that portfolio is linked to inflation in terms of rent increases. So that will work its way higher gradually over time, assuming that uh, inflation keeps happening, which I think it will, and it makes a reasonable hedge against that. Um, in terms of their kind of sector distribution, they're about 25% of their income, not necessarily their number of buildings, but if you think about it by their rental income, 25% of that comes from Steve's favourite REIT sector, which is industrial. About 17% comes from healthcare one way or another. Um, I think that's mostly care homes. So that's mostly stands to benefit from an ageing population, uh, I think, along the way. Um Let's talk about the other things we normally talk about here then. So the average time to first break on their lease contracts is 17 years. That's probably fine. Uh, rent collection seems unlikely. 100% collection, uh, sorry, rent collection failures seem unlikely. They're 100% occupied and 100% collecting at the moment. So the question becomes, what about their own debt? Because they do have some. They have about 41 million on a loan from Canada Life, uh, obviously the the UK REIT funder of choice. Um, they're currently paying about 3% on. 3% is all right on about 41 million. The trouble is that has about two years left to run uh, and then it comes due. They have a choice here, I guess. Uh, they can either sell something or probably quite a bit of stuff, to be honest, given the value of their portfolio, uh, to try and service that and pay it back. I wouldn't like to see them do that. Or they can refinance it. And if they refinance it, Two years ahead, what sort of rate are we looking at? Well, we could be looking at somewhere in the region of 5 to 6%, so around double at the moment, which is not great, but is probably not a disaster. So they have about 6.9 million in operating income, uh, and they're currently paying out... Uh, 5% would boost their 
outgoings for uh, in interest, sorry, from about 1.4 million to about 2.1 million. So it would add another 50% to it, but it would still be way under their kind of operating income levels. Added to that, they continue to increase their rents. I think they'll get some way towards offsetting this a bit. Um, you might see a slight decline in that case, but I think it would probably stay fairly flat, which brings me to my usual thought about REITs. I'm wary about their ability to grow uh, in pretty much every case because they either do it by taking on debt or they do it by issuing equity because they can't hold on to their cash. Um, at the moment, with a 9% yield, I'm not convinced this does need very much growing. This has been a theme of the three REITs that I've talked about from the UK fairly recently and indeed with realty income to an extent. I'm not, I wouldn't buy one of these things on the assumption that it will grow. That said, the growth, um, I guess... Uh, uh, opportunity set looks quite different here um, to either Realty Income or um, any of the routes I've talked about before. So this is a diversified operation, which means it does kind of, that has puts and takes from what I can see of it, but the benefit probably comes on the growth side. So if you're a primary health properties or a supermarket income REIT, I think the UK can only hold so many primary health properties and supermarkets. Uh, there is going to be a finite limit to that, especially in supermarket income REITs case. Growth is going to be hard. Building out that portfolio is going to be hard. Um, uh, in the case of a diversified REIT, though, you can pick up a variety of different properties along the way. You have far more opportunities available to you. Plus, this thing has a 53 million market cap. There's loads of scope to grow. Contra realty income, which is absolutely enormous and increasingly trying to do deals that it thinks size is an advantage for. But I think there are certainly cases where deals are going to be general too small to make them any bigger. Um PSR is a slightly different story in the sense that house building seems to keep happening, so there's probably a decent supply of houses coming online going forward, even if we get a slowdown from construction output in a recession. Uh, that's the last of my REITs for the foreseeable future, Steve. Um, I've had a decent time with these just lately. Over the last month or so, PRS is up uh, 13%, supermarket income 13.5%, primary health properties 11 No one should give me any credit for that whatsoever. I said I thought they looked cheap, but I didn't think they were going up anytime soon. Uh, what do you think of this, Steve? So, I, I mean, I'm reading the annual report. It's the first time I've ever seen it, so you'll have to excuse me. But what an collective mix of real estate! Uh, sort of, they've got not like 19 properties. Yep, and the, the, it's pretty crazy. So they've got a, a massive residential building in Salford. They've got an industrial estate in St Helens and Dudley. Then they've got a Premier Inn, a Mercure Hotel in Glasgow, which is a you know a posh. A hop end, a top end uh, hotel, and then we've got a motor point in Birmingham. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, what look like care homes, a travel lodge, a B and M, uh, Hodston uh, Energy Power Station, Hodston, Hodston. Uh, then the wonderful place in Brough, which is local. Uh, they've got a Volvo, uh, a Pure Gym, a petrol station, and a Snap Fitness Centre in the middle of London. Um, I got it. Just my worry with something like this is that how can you be the expert on all of those things? Do you know what I mean? I think that's the issue that I would have with this REIT straight off the bat is looking at this 19 properties saying, I mean, there's, there's also, so there's education, leather, uh, leisure, sorry, not leather, uh, automotive and petroleum, industrial, um, automotive, retail, hotels, healthcare, power stations. I just, don't think across that amount of regions and that amount of areas you could be an expert in all of those areas. So it's either that the management are really, really, um, you know, really, really good at buying great properties all over the UK and have experience of doing so in various numbers of sectors, or that they're they're a bit willy nilly with the purchasing and the buying, uh, you know, whatever they can get their hands on. And that that would be my main worry looking at this. But like I say, this is the first time I've ever heard of this company. And while you're doing it, I was just like flick reading through the uh, the report. Uh, in terms of their actual balance sheet, it, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, so whatever they've done has worked okay so far. Um, I think they're they're quite fair in the way that they're valuing the, their their um, their buildings as well. They're they're not they're not shying away from knocking down the value of those buildings uh, and also uh, discussing about what they've sold and what they've bought. So. It's a very good report, Steve, for such a small business. I think they've spent a lot of money on putting this together and a lot of care and attention. So if people are interested in it, then the the uh, the full annual report and financial statements is uh, is fairly up to date. Thirtieth of June. It's um it's it's definitely worth a flick through. Yeah, nineteen properties. You know, people that own more properties than that. But um, 
uh, to your point, uh, I said there were puts and takes to being diversified here, and I said one of the benefits is you have a bigger opportunity set. The take on that is exactly what you were uh, sketching of uh, you hard to be an expert in all of these sorts of areas, um, and and you can get quite scattered in these things. And in general, uh, thinking even more broadly than REITs for the moment, the market tends to agree with you uh, on that thought. The market likes in on the whole, and it depends on what it is, right? If it's coal, then less so. But the market tends to like pure play things, um, and it, much more plausible. It finds it much more plausible to say. Look, here's what we understand. Supermarkets. We're going to go and buy and sell and lease supermarkets because we know more about supermarkets than the guy who's also worrying about um, care homes and industrial distribution centers uh, in the same way. And I think there is some good plausibility to that. I mean, on the balance sheet, yeah, you can't you can't run a massively levered balance sheet when you have a 53 million market cap and a portfolio that size. You just your balance sheet has to be in decent shape there. It probably looks a lot more healthy than something like realty incomes, but that's because it's a lot more fragile as a business, right? Realty income loses a tenant you don't notice, basically. Uh, it takes off less than 1% of their uh, rental income. You lose a tenant off of 19, um, and you're looking at a big lump out of things. So uh, there is intrinsically more risk with going smaller here. There's arguably more opportunity in terms of growth, but that doesn't really make much sense in terms of a REITs. Uh, so I'm not looking at it um, that way. I think what I look for when I think REITs, I think pretty defensive operations. I'm not really a dividend investor, to be honest, but but if someone offered me a good enough one, I, I'm not enough of an anti-dividend investor to not take it, I think. And that's kind of why I've been uh, looking at this sort of real estate sector in general over the last however yeah. long. This is the last one, though, I promise. Yeah, it's about total to 10, isn't it? You're looking mm. at dividends in isolation versus looking at something there that you think, well, look, this company could grow from here. But realistically, if it stays roughly how it is uh, and grows rent with inflation and grows a dividend with it, then 9% is a great return to start from. So when you're looking at a 9% return, you can often think, well, if I'm losing 9% share price here, then it's absolutely pointless. But with something like this, you would hope for stability uh, and a return in, in 